Prey is an interesting title for many reasons. First of all, the history of the IP with the original 2006 game, and the cancelled Prey 2 which looked fantastic. And second of all, the game itself. Prey wasn't as successful as other Bethesda published titles such as Doom, Fallout or Wolfenstein, but over the past couple years, it has sparked a love for the game that matches other Bethesda IPs. It's sort of a cult classic in that aspect. When Prey first released, it seemed to have generally positive, though slightly mixed reception, and it's not as if there wasn't a reason for it. For example, the console versions of the games did have their fair share of bugs day one, and the IGN review stated that they encountered a bug which prevented them from finishing the game. Ouch. Another aspect is that the marketing for the game was frankly not too good. The trailers gave no real idea as to what the game is apart from aliens in space with guns. And how many games can you list with that description? Nobody knew what type of game it was. Was it a horror FPS? Was it a game like Bioshock? Was it your standard FPS game set in space? Another problem is the title of the game, Prey. The 2017 game has literally nothing to do with the original game at all. The only similarities that they share is the name and the fact that the game is set in space with aliens and guns. And the fact that Prey 2 was a heavily anticipated game that was unfortunately cancelled. And this may have led some people to believe that Prey 2 got turned into this game or that this game was connected to the original game, to which the developers had to explicitly state that it wasn't. And in that case, why name it Prey? Like, okay, yes, you do technically own the IP, but given it the same name as a game you published a decade ago that is also not related to that game in any way whatsoever, confuses people. Many have suggested that the game should have been named something such as Neuroshock, similar to System Shock and Bioshock, and yes, that would have been a much better idea. People would better understand it as a new IP, and they would understand what type of game it is from the name alone. People would understand that the gameplay in this game is something similar to System Shock 2 or Bioshock, which are really popular games as well, so it means the game probably would have been even more successful. So yeah, the marketing for the game was a nightmare, but that hasn't stopped those who have played the game from loving it. Prey is considered to be the best immersive sim ever made, even beaten out System Shock 2, and many claim the game is one of the best games of the 2010s. Many even say it's one of the best games ever made. And after a year or so of getting footage for the game, I think I have enough material to work with to critique the game in detail. I'll also be covering the DLC and multiplayer in this video. But anyway, here's my retrospective of Prey 2017. Prey is an immersive sim inspired by System Shock 2. The gameplay has a nice mix of combat, exploration, and puzzles. I'll start off with the combat, which is really good. The weapons are all fun to use and give unique options during combat. The wrench is your standard melee weapon. It's effective against mimics and is useful for sneak attacks. If you attack a phantom from behind without them noticing you, then you get an extra boost of damage without having to use any ammo. While attacks can be spammed, you run out of stamina quickly doing that. Thus the wrench is more useful with charge attacks which do more damage with less stamina used. Obviously it isn't useful for ranged combat, but it's never useless throughout the entire game as it can come in handy against mimics and phantoms, which are the most common enemies. It's also useful for things such as breaking glass or getting through glue spheres. The wrench works well overall. The suppressed pistol is great too. One detail I like is that it's not suppressed for stealth purposes. It's because of the way gunshots echo upon the surfaces of Talos 1, which would pretty much deafen the user. I like that small piece of world building. The pistol is cool, as it has a fast fire rate and some pretty decent accuracy. It works well against mimics and phantoms, but it can struggle against tougher enemies. Luckily, you can upgrade every weapon in the game to have more ammo, do more damage, or have better accuracy. So, these can be overcome. 
It has advantages over weapons like the shotgun, as you don't have delays in between shots, or the Q-beam, since the reload for the pistol is really quick, whereas the Q-beam takes forever to reload. So it's useful for situations where you need to be quick in dispatching an enemy, or are running and gunning for the goal, but it still lacks in firepower, which is an aspect the shotgun works really well in. The shotgun is your standard video game shotgun. It kills most mimics in one shot and kills phantoms in a little more depending on the type. Plus it can stagger enemies much easier than the pistol, so it also works for stun attacks. It's still useful against stronger enemies but does take much more firepower to put them down. It's a satisfying weapon and works well without making the pistol obsolete. The Q-Beam is an awesome weapon as it shoots out a laser that lowers the enemy's health bar. The green part of the bar is how much health the Q-Beam has taken off. The red is obviously how much health is left. The downside is that if you use the Q-Beam too much on enemies, then it doesn't leave a body to loot. I also like that it's a weapon that's effective in of itself, but it's more effective when used in combination with other weapons. For example, you could use the Q-Beam to lower a bit of the enemy's health, and then finish them off with a shotgun or pistol. The Stun Disruptor does no damage, but it stuns enemies at shocks, and can short-circuit turrets and operators allowing you to run away or given an opportunity to attack. It's quick to charge, but does require you to be quite close to the enemy, which means the enemy has a chance to attack you. So it's a risk versus reward kind of weapon. And it's useful against every enemy in the game, since any of them can be stunned. The glue gun is also insanely useful. It once again does no damage, but it creates spheres of glue which can be used to get to areas out of reach, put out fires, and stop enemies dead in their tracks which is useful for obvious reasons. It can help you escape to areas that are hard for the enemy to reach, or stop them in their tracks while you shoot them to pieces. It's useful in pretty much every single combat encounter. The weapons are all really useful in the game. They all have unique uses and unique strengths as well as distinct weaknesses that are outclassed by strengths of other weapons. And most of the weapons are at their best when used in combination with other weapons. The weapons in the game are cool, but they aren't the only things you can use in combat. There are other tools that take this game's combat from, yeah, it's pretty fun, to, yeah, it's fucking amazing. There are a bunch of grenades, all of which function differently. You have recycler charges, which turn anything into a big ball of the material it's made out of, whether it be organic or synthetic. It isn't exclusive to enemies as well, as it can be used to clear rooms with debris. But against enemies, it's godly. Even if it doesn't kill the enemy, it'll reduce them to a level where they can be easily killed. There are some weaknesses by using this, however. First of all, it's just as effective against you as the enemies you face, so you can accidentally get yourself killed whilst using it. Second, it doesn't really work best while airborne, so it doesn't work against floating enemies. But it's still really satisfying to see a phantom creepily walking towards you, only to see it disappear into its most basic atomic structure. There are EMP charges which are useful against electric typhon or turrets and operators, and it will temporarily disable them. There are also no wave charges, which will temporarily disable abilities of typhon, so they can't shoot big spheres at you or duplicate or set you on fire. They can still do basic attacks, but it nulls their special powers. And there is the typhon law, which, as the name suggests, lures typhon over to wherever it is placed which is useful if you're low on resources and aren't in a fighting position, or if you want to move a Typhon over to a location where you are better suited to take him out. So the grenades have a lot of practical uses and can be used in combination with the guns to create unique and interesting combat scenarios. It adds so much depth, replayability, and creativity to the game. But once again, that's not all of the combat since Neuromods exist. They take the combat to an entirely another level. Especially with Typhon abilities. You can have bullet time and do cool max pain moves. You can do kinetic blast which creates a circle of explosive energy that does a lot of damage to anything within that circle. There are different versions such as electrostatic which is the same but with electricity. Or super thermal which allows you to spawn fire anywhere and set enemies on fire. You can mimic objects like turrets and destroy Typhon. You can create your own phantoms that fight for you. Backlash makes it so where any damage you take is then reversed onto the enemy. Psychoshock damages the mind of Typhon and nulls their abilities and does damage to them. 
There are so many unique combat scenarios that can be created with just these abilities, and when you mix them in with the weapons and tools at your disposal, there are so many combinations of attacks you can use on enemies, and there is so much creativity you can have within the combat. The combat is fun in Zero-G as well, it's just that there aren't as many Zero-G enemies so you can't experiment as much. The only criticism I have about Prey's combat is that when reloading a weapon, you have to wait until the reload animation is finished until you can switch to something else, which can be annoying and slow down combat a bit. It can also be a life or death situation since I might be trying to switch to another weapon to kill the enemy, but I can't because I have to wait until the reload animation finishes, which could get me killed. But otherwise, it's an absolute blast to play around with. Anyone who says the combat in this game is lackluster hasn't played around with any of the unique mechanics the game gives to you. But what are the combat mechanics if the enemies aren't fun to fight? Well, the first you encounter is called a Mimic, which can mimic any object in the environment. They can surprise attack you, and are a pretty dangerous opponent by the fact that you could walk into a room and not immediately know there is an enemy in there with you. However, you can figure out what object a Mimic is through a few signs. First of all, they make a clicking noise when you're in the vicinity. This doesn't tell you which object the Mimic is, but it will at least get you prepared for a fight. Second off, you have to kind of read the room and see what doesn't fit. Say an item is out of place, or if it seems like there's too many of one item, then yeah, one of them's probably a Mimic. Third, the Mimics do sometimes move while in the Mimic state, which is a dead giveaway, though this only happens a few times. The Mimic itself can also put up a decent fight, as it's good at avoiding your wrench attacks and does a fair bit of damage. So they not only have the element of surprise, but can back up a decent fight, especially in groups. Plus, all of their attacks are very well telegraphed, so it's a great enemy overall. The Phantom is fun to fight as well. It has a variety of long-range and close-range attacks that do quite a lot of damage. He can teleport around very quickly and attack ferociously. There are plenty of ways to stun and counter his attacks. And just like the Mimic, there is also some alternate versions of him, such as Electric, which has less long-range potential but makes up for it for damaging you for even coming close to him. Thermal, which can set where you're standing on fire, and my personal favourite, the Etheric Phantom, which has the ability to duplicate itself for double the pain. He's fast, he's deadly, and he'll keep you on your toes the entire time you're fighting him. Once again, all of his attacks are well telegraphed, with the exception of this attack. I think it could have been slowed down by a couple milliseconds, as it sometimes feels too fast to counter. Otherwise, he's an amazing enemy to fight and challenges you in a bunch of different ways. The Cystoid sends out little Typhon at you that explode when you get close. Not much to this one. It does damage you, but it's never life-threatening unless there's a whole bunch of them. The Poltergeist is a very cool enemy, though. The Poltergeist is an enemy that is invisible until it uses its powers. It can lift you into the ceiling, throw objects at you, and if you attack him at close range, it damages you. So fighting him can be a challenge. You can attack him while he's invisible, but unless you have a good idea of where he is, it's a guessing game until you can see him. He's different from other enemies in the game, as other enemies encourage the player to be more proactive, whereas the Poltergeist supports a more reactive playstyle. It's a nice switch up of pace. Next are the Technopath and the Telepath, which function in a very similar way. The Technopath uses technologies such as operators and turrets against you, and can shoot out electricity. He's very tough to deal with and can tank a lot of damage. Plus, he can send out a shockwave at close range. But fortunately, you do have a lot of attacks that are perfect for this guy, in particular Norwave and EMP-related attacks. The Telepath is similar to the Technopath, but he uses biological attacks. Instead of turrets or operators, it controls the minds of humans that patrol the environments and can give away your location. They will then start running to you and explode their heads and kill you, which forces you to either kill them or if you want to keep them alive, you can shock them with the Disruptor. The Telepath itself shoots out orbs that follow you, and if you get too close, it will release a Null Wave Shock, disabling your Typhon abilities. Both enemies can be really tough to fight due to their abilities, but you have a lot of powers such as Psycho Shock or Null Wave Transmitters, which massively help out during fights like this. They're different from other enemies such as Mimics and Phantoms, as they aren't focused on being up close and personal, but are more focused on staying at a distance and killing you effectively. They're challenging and a lot of fun to play around with. 
The operators and turrets around the station pose a threat as well, especially later on in the game with the security operators that have armor and lasers. The turrets are interesting as they never really become a threat unless you take Typhon Neuromods, which makes them recognize you as Typhon. Which can make sections of the game that you could easily walk through a puzzle that you need to figure out. Operators will also attack you on site if you have installed too many Neuromods. Which adds more interesting decisions to installing Neuromods as they increase your chances of survival, but also create more troubles in the process. But, since I've talked about all the good enemies, I need to mention one that sucks. The Nightmare. The Nightmare is interesting as a concept. He's a giant Typhon that can kill you in one hit, and relentlessly hunt you down for three minutes straight. Your choices are to either avoid him, or kill him and get some rewards. The issue is that he can't fit through small doors, and thus it's really easy to evade him just by hiding in a small room for three minutes. Fighting him is fun, but it's not a very effective option. I may get some rewards for fighting him, but I could just hide here for the next three minutes and listen to some music until the timer hits zero. Later on, you can collect some audio samples that attract the Nightmare, but also get rid of him. So avoiding him becomes even easier and is a better choice overall. It's a real shame, because he looks really cool, and he is fun to fight, but he doesn't work with any of the levels in the game. They're too small for him, and they just don't really work well. So combat-wise, Prey is fantastic. The weapons, tools, powers, and enemies are all fun to play around with, and have lots of creativity that can be explored. Moving on to the level design, it's amazing in this game. Each area has a unique layout and vibe going on. Lots of interesting combat situations can happen in the levels, such as the walkway in the lobby can be cool to fight enemies on because of the broken glass. You can use it to drop them to the floor and kill them, and as a way to stop them from getting to you or the power plant, where traversal involves constant ascending or descending. It's a lot of fun to engage in combat with Technopaths in here, since you can glide around and have more mid-air and mobile combat. It's also fun to fight enemies whilst going up or down the levels. There are different rooms that have different designs and materials in them. One may have a lot of explosive materials, whilst the other has heavy objects you can launch at enemies, or maybe turrets. There's a lot of creative ways to set up defense and get into rooms that you don't have the combination or keycard for. Most locations in the game are so densely packed that you could explore them for hours, finding new items, weapons, text logs, audio logs, etc. And places you visit can change later on in the game. Early in the game, the lobby is pretty empty aside from a few Typhon here and there, but as the game goes on, the lobby will become overrun with Typhon. Same with a lot of other locations. It makes the exploration more dynamic. The levels themselves don't change, but what's going on in them does, so you can't think you're safe just because you cleared out an area a few hours ago. You may go back and find a telepath controlling everyone. Or operators may have deployed more, or turrets you set up for security may turn on you because you installed more neuromods. You can never be sure that you're safe in this game. Nowhere on the station is safe, and you're always at risk. Plus, the way you explore levels is really fun too. The glue gun is one of the coolest weapons in recent memory, because you can basically create paths to any place in the game. Is a ledge out of reach? Build a staircase up. Is there a gap between you and another place? Build a bridge. Are the lift shafts broken and you have no spare parts to fix them? Build some glue spheres and climb them. Is an object block in your way? You can use Neuromods to move it, or use a recycler charge to get rid of it. Or use an explosive to blow the objects out of the way. This makes the levels more entertaining to explore, as you're not just exploring an x-axis, you're also exploring a y-axis. You are constantly looking up and down to see where you can climb or glide to. You're always focusing on the entire environment and not just what's directly in front of you. There are also creative ways to get into locked areas. Like for example, here's a door with a keycard that I don't have. How do I get in? Well. The game has a toy nerf gun that doesn't damage enemies, but it can interact with things in the environment, so I can shoot it at the manual release button for the door to open it. Or I could use the mimic ability to mimic a small object and get through the small gap in the glass. Or if it's a code and you don't have the combination, then you can hack it. The hacking minigame is fun, but there's an issue with the timer. Hacking level 3 and 4 give way too much time to hack, and thus hacking level 2 is technically the hardest. I don't know why it's the case, I don't know if it wasn't playtested correctly. It's a minor criticism, but it does make hacking later on in the game much easier if you have upgraded the ability, because later on they start using level 3 and 4 hacking, which is easier. 
Though you can also find the combination for the door through emails or through the environment. One of my favorites is at the beginning of the game, where you see a safe and the whiteboard shows the code, but it has been rubbed off. However, when you watch videos from an earlier point in time, you can see the code, and if you return to that area later, then you can enter it. Another favorite of mine is when a scientist sets the safe code as two periodic elements. If you know them off by heart, you can enter the code, but if not, you then have to search the periodic table in the scientist's office to figure out the code. They're not insanely deep, but I like that there's a bit more to them in order to figure out the code. The levels are so densely packed with things to do and creative ways to explore them. I'm sure I haven't listed everything here or have missed something, because there is so much you can do in the levels. You could spend hours, and I mean hours, exploring individual areas in this game. And how could I forget Zero Gravity? Both in space and in the Guts tunnel system, it's so much fun. The controls are so smooth, and combat where you can move in any direction at any time is a lot of fun. It's more limited out here since you can only face enemies that are airborne, but it's still so good. Plus, every location in this game looks so damn good. Whether you're floating around in outer space in awe of the size of Talos 1, or you're enjoying the plant life in the Arboretum, the sleek look of the crew quarters and the lobby, the industrial look of the work areas, Everywhere looks so distinct and beautiful. The game's visuals are reminiscent of Dishonored, in fact the character designs look kinda similar, but as a whole, it's wildly different. You can look at a screenshot from Prey and tell it's Prey. The color palette, the art design, the structure, this game is so wonderful to look at, even if it is lacking a bit graphically. Graphically the game either looks pretty good or just meh. Prey's level design is fantastic. It's perfect for interesting combat situations, it's packed with hours worth of things to do and explore, there are interesting ways to traverse the environment, and every area looks amazing. I've been playing this game since it released in 2017, and I still find myself wandering Talos 1 taking it all in. So yeah, the levels and exploration is amazing, some of the best I've ever experienced. In terms of progression, this game does a fantastic job with that too. Neuromods are the most obvious part of this category, since you can gain new abilities with them. At first, you can only get human Neuromods, which encourage you to explore the environment to find them, but later on you can get Typhon Neuromods, which you have to scan enemies to get their abilities. I like the way this is done, as it encourages exploration and observing enemies. It's sort of like the camera mechanic in Bioshock, where you take pictures of splices to gain new stuff. The game also knows when to throw in new things. It knows when you need a new enemy to spice up combat. It knows when you need a new weapon. It knows when to put restrictions on you to make the game more challenging. The game is always enforcing new challenges on the player. You're always discovering new stuff in the game. Every era you go to gives you a lot of new challenges and interesting ways to explore. It's why the gameplay loop of this game will never become boring to me. Plus there is the fact of multiple playthroughs. I've played through Prey at least 20 times since 2017, and each time I've noticed something new or tried something new. I've done no Typhon Neuromod playthroughs, no Neuromod playthroughs, no Firearm playthroughs, no Glue Gun playthroughs, etc. And despite limiting myself in all of those, it forces you to be more creative in how you play. Just playing the game normally is a lot of fun, but it's also great to experiment with different ways to play the game. It's why the game has gotten more popular over the last couple years instead of its notoriety going down. More and more people play it and keep going back to play it. However, I do have some criticisms to make here. First of all, the tutorials in the game are frankly shit. The most you'll get is a pop-up explaining the basic fundamentals of a weapon or thing you can do in the game. My biggest issue is that they don't really tell you what type of game this is. As said before, Prey's combat is puzzle-based where you need to figure out a method on how to take enemies down. However, a lot of people may not realize that, and instead play the game like it's Call of Duty, where they just keep shooting the enemy until it's dead and waste all of their ammo. Prey isn't a typical first-person shooter, but some may think the combat is like that, because they see a pistol or shotgun or a laser beam and think, hmm, yeah, this will kill the enemy really, really fast. The game doesn't provide any examples of how they can be used in combat, or how they can be used in combination with other weapons to take them down, or how you can combine them with neuromod abilities or tools, or other stuff. It just says, yeah, it's a shotgun, it shoots stuff. Why not say something like, the shotgun does a good amount of damage at close range, using it in combination with the stun gun or glue gun, or neuromod abilities enhances the use of the weapon. 
then the player might be like, oh, if I want to get as much use of this weapon as possible, then I better use other abilities and other tools at my disposal. Second, while all the enemy's attacks do have ways to avoid them, they aren't always clear. For example, the telepath can let out a wide circle of damage. There are ways around this with stuns, null waves, or just keeping a distance, but you don't learn that ability until it already uses it on you. The game shows that phantoms can whip around, and that mimics can become any object, so why doesn't it show you what this guy can do? Like, okay, you don't have to show me everything. For example, when the telepath shoots out these orbs, I can figure out how that works on the spot since I have time to react to it. Same with phantoms and their projectiles, or thermal phantoms with their fire. Basically, the game should have made it more clear on how certain enemies and their attacks work before you fight them. Suit chipsets are useless for the most part and forgettable. They only improve small aspects of Morgan and do very little to enhance the gameplay. I think the chipsets could have been more unique. For example, one can give you the ability to double jump, or one removes splash damage from your Typhon abilities. That would be cool. Also, one of them shows the location of Mimics. How stupid do you have to be to ruin one of the best mechanics and best enemies of the game? Another is the loading screens. Whenever you go into a new area, there's a loading screen, which... Alright, sounds fun. But the loading screens can take upwards of a minute, and even worse, there are two loading screens. Yes, the first loading screen ends, then another pops up. So there is a loading screen to a loading screen. Like, yeah, okay, I get there needs to be loading screens when you go to new areas, because of hardware limitations and all. In an ideal world, you could just go between areas seamlessly, but hardware limitations. So, I get it, okay? Loading screens. But why two loading screens? Does the first one load something and then the second one load something different? Does the first one load the level and then the second one load the assets? Like, what's going on here? Why does the game have two loading screens? It takes away from the pace of the game. It's not a game-breaking issue, but it can be annoying to go to a new area and have to wait a minute before continuing the game. A problem with the exploration as well is that about halfway through the game, there aren't that many exciting things to find loot-wise. The exploration itself doesn't get boring, and you're always getting new stuff in terms of challenges and upgrades, but most of the stuff you find in the environment is stuff like ammo, neuromods and waste materials and other things. And after a while, that's pretty much all you find exploring. It's not that these aren't useful, or that there is no reason to explore, it's just that exploring doesn't become as exciting later on in the game. You can get stuff like a golden pistol, but there aren't many things like that. I think the game could have done with a few really cool secret items that are hard to find, but when you find them you're like, yo, holy shit! Like how about a super duper secret weapon that is really hard to get but is so powerful and satisfying to use? Otherwise, exploring isn't as interesting later on in the game as in the beginning. Early on in the game you get new weapons and tools, but halfway through the game you have most or maybe all of them, so there isn't much left. And while I like the Neuromod abilities, I don't like the fact that you can craft them later on in the game, and it takes away from the enjoyment of finding them. While I love this game, these are issues I've had on every playthrough. I've gotten used to them by now, so they aren't as big of a deal to me but they are still problems nonetheless. Problems that don't stop this game from being a masterpiece, but problems nonetheless. When all is said and done though, Prey is a genuine masterpiece. Not because it's perfect, I've explained why it isn't, but because not only is it the best game in its genre, but also of how well all the mechanics function together. The combat's puzzle-based nature makes it more unique and interesting than most traditional FPS games, the level design perfectly fits these combat scenarios, as well as the exploration and how you explore the X and Y axis being really interesting. The multiple options that you have and how to progress, the fact that your upgrades have big consequences, the scenery, how densely packed each area is with things to do. It's all so well done that I can overlook pretty much all of these issues. It might be because I've played the game so much and I've gotten so used to it, but even with these annoying issues, I would still say that almost the entire game is masterfully crafted. It just has issues that stop it from being perfect. The game gets better each time you play it, and it has endless replay value. Prey is a masterpiece based on its gameplay alone. While Prey's gameplay has been acclaimed by those who've played it, the story however is a bit more mixed. Prey begins with Morgan waking up in their apartment, checking emails, having a shower, taking a shit. The usual. 
Why doesn't this game have working mirrors? Max Payne 2 had working mirrors in 2003. Anyway, a detail I like is that the apartment changes slightly depending on which gender you pick. If you pick male, then you'll see ties hanging up and the toilet seat will be up. If you pick female, then you'll see necklaces, a handbag, and the toilet seat is down. It's a small detail, but I like the fact they even bothered to put this detail in. Anyway, you get a call from your brother Alex that you're needed in the Transtar testing labs. He's so nice that he even sent a special helicopter to transport you to the building. Then, one of the best opening credit sequences ever plays. I'll talk about the soundtrack later, but I think the reason everything is going to be okay has become such an iconic piece of music is not only due to the music itself, but the sequence it's associated with. It's a relaxing sequence where you ride through the city enjoying the view. Morgan even taps to the beat. It's the only time in the entire game where you feel relaxed and upbeat, which is why this moment sticks out so much and is so memorable. It's not like anything that's about to come next. Morgan arrives at the facility, and your brother tells you that it's just a couple of tests. Hey, you don't look terrible in a Transtar uniform. How's your eye? Still red? I know the tests might seem a little unconventional, but it's a new family tradition. Breaking convention is in our blood. Morgan then partakes in the tests, and the observers seem very confused by the results. Morgan then takes a quiz at the end before this happens. Prey begins with Morgan waking up in their apartment, checking emails, having a shower, taking a shit. The usual. Why doesn't this game have working mirrors? Max Payne 2 had working mirrors in 2003. Anyway, a detail I like, oh shit. Something clearly hasn't gone right here. Morgan then breaks out of their apartment only to find out... It was all a lie. There never was an apartment, there was no helicopter, and there is no city, and Morgan isn't even on Earth. This is one of the most memorable sequences of any game. The fact that the first 10 to 15 minutes you've just experienced was all an illusion. After playing this sequence, how can you trust if anything in the game is real anymore? What I also like is that there are actually multiple hints towards the fact that what you're seeing isn't real. First of all, the apartment. The shadows are facing multiple directions when sunlight only comes from one direction. Second, the marks on the floor from the way the rooms change. When you go into an elevator, you aren't actually going up or down. The room is just changing whilst the door's closed, and the elevator is shaking a bit to give it the illusion of going up or down. Next, if you pay attention whilst in the helicopter, the looking glass technology flickers for a single frame. You can also see your apartment room in the background of the testing area, despite the fact that it was supposed to be in a completely different building across the city. The tests are interesting though. The reason why the observers are confused is because you're supposed to be using Typhon Neuromods in these tests, but you aren't. The one where you move the boxes, for example. They're expecting Morgan to grab them from afar using Neuromods, but instead Morgan runs over and just grabs them. Or the one with the chair where they tie you to hide. They're expecting you to mimic the chair. Or the test with the button across the room. They're expecting you to use remote hack, but Morgan doesn't have the mods installed, so they just do the tests in the way they think's best. Continuing on, you are contacted by someone named January, who has your voice. You discover that January is not a person, but an operator that Morgan programmed to fulfill certain objectives. 
January tries to show you a video, but Alex cuts it off before you can watch all of it, which means you have to go get it connected again. In the video, Morgan is explaining to themself what the situation is. Your memory's shot full of holes. I know. I'm sorry, but it's permanent. So the first thing you need to know is you can trust January. It's an operator, a sort of backup of you and me. It knows what you've forgotten. We've been testing a new kind of neuromod based on the Typhon organisms, mapping their neural patterns onto ours. Problem is, when you uninstall a neuromod, it resets your memory back to the moment you first put it in. That's why you forget. There's supposed to be a process to bring you back up to speed between test runs. But someone could just skip that part, turn a single day into your entire life. Well, that's exactly what Alex did. You're not gonna like what I have to say next. You have to destroy Talos One. The research, the Typhon, nothing can survive, including you. I know how it sounds, but you've seen what those creatures can do. They're a part of you now. If even one cell gets back to Earth, we're lost. I'm sorry, I wish there was another way. Trendstar has been experimenting for a while with the Typhon's abilities and using them with Neuromods. Basically, neuromods are used to map certain abilities onto the brain. For example, knowing how to play a piano. If you use a neuromod to map that onto your brain, then now you can play a piano. It basically makes you able to do things you previously weren't able to do. However, they only enhance a human by mapping knowledge of something onto their brain. Which is useful, because years of training can be condensed to a single neuromod. Transtar researched this further by injecting Typhon abilities into neuromods. The issue with neuromods, though, is that when you uninstall them, it resets your memory back to when you first installed it. So, for example, if you installed a neuromod that gave you the ability to lift objects without even touching them, and then removed it five years later, your brain would be reset to five years ago. Everything that happened in those five years would be gone to you. It would be like it never happened. They experimented with this, and Morgan was one of the subjects. Morgan was reliving the same day over and over and over and over and over, and Transtar would remove neuromods every time to make sure Morgan completely forgot that day. The quiz at the end was meant to monitor any changes in Morgan's behaviour. Morgan wasn't the only subject though. Transtar would find random nobodies, mostly Russian prisoners, and do tests on them as if they were guinea pigs. If you listen to the audio logs and watch videos from before the events of the game, Morgan initially seems very keen on doing these tests, but after seeing how it's being used on people, starts to back away from them, and even tries to stop them. It's not clear on how many times Morgan's memory has been reset, but it's clear it's more than just a couple of times. Which is why January exists. Morgan built January in secret, which contained Morgan's current memories at the time, as well as Morgan's plans to deal with the Typhon on Talos 1. However, January wasn't the only operator, as Morgan built December, and it's also hinted that November and October operators existed as well. January is keen on destroying Talos 1 to make sure not a single Typhon cell makes its way back to Earth. December, though, has plans for Morgan to use an escape pod and say fuck it and leave. It's also hinted that the October and November operators also had different plans to deal with the situation, and Morgan's plans changed every month, possibly due to the change in thoughts and behaviour and the memory loss. This is an interesting story and conflict for the main character and the player. It's not really clear who you should trust. You might trust January, because January is the first friendly face you meet, and the game takes place in February, and thus it's the most recent operator Morgan built and might be the closest to what Morgan's plans right now would be, but at the same time that doesn't really matter when Morgan's memories were constantly erased and Morgan's thought process sporadically changed with developing a bomb that would destroy all the Typhon, to escaping the Typhon, to then blowing the whole place up. Plus, you the player are a different Morgan now than this Morgan was. January is just one of several different versions of Morgan. You have different experiences than this one did. Who's to say that blowing up the station isn't just a desperate final attempt to deal with the Typhon? You can actually kill January right at the start of the game, and do December's storyline instead. If not, then January will kill December from trying to stop the current plan. But who's to say that January is more trustworthy? Both are Morgan, but just from different points in time with a different thought process. You might say that blowing up the station will destroy the Typhon, which 
might be true, but how can you be sure that'll work? What if they manage to survive somehow and you end up killing everyone on board, all the while achieving nothing? But it's not the best idea to abandon ship either. There's also the Morgan that you're playing as right now. Do you agree with what either of them say? Do you view these operators as you? Or do you view them as completely different people? Only an hour into the game, and there's already so much for the player to consider. Do I go along with what January says? Should I trust December instead? Or do I just do whatever I want because I am my own Morgan? It's why I like Morgan Yu as a character. There are several different versions of Morgan, good and evil, but it's up to the player whether or not they trust any of what the previous Morgans have to say. Yeah, it's pretty weird not to trust yourself when you see yourself saying those words, but at the same time, that wasn't you. The Morgan that you're playing now isn't the same Morgan that December or January is, or even the video files or audio files you watch and listen to. Do you want to follow in their footsteps, or be your own person? Why should I trust this version of Morgan that tells me to blow up the station over the one that tells me to escape it? You might say one has a better method than the other, but once again, it just comes down to which ideals you agree with more. Plus, it's interesting when you interact with other characters such as Michaela. She is trying to figure out what happened to her father. You can find an audio file that confirms Morgan killed her father, and you can choose whether or not to play the audio file for her, and she will judge you for it. <clears throat> Chief Uliushin, this is a complicated matter. Shut up. You? Perform the procedure? The what? Killed him? And you knew? Why? You didn't know. You don't even know what you've done! Chief Uliushin, Morgan has no memory of the log you've listened to. Go to hell, January. You speak with his voice, you might as well be his conscience. Lack of conscience. And to think, Morgan... I thought you were trying to help me. Why would you save me to do... this? To buy back some guilt? So I'd forgive you? My father is right. You don't understand. Your father, mother, your stupid, deluded brother... You will never understand family. You don't even understand what it means to be human. Get the hell away from me. There is also the fact that these Morgans don't really exist anymore, apart from the objectives and knowledge of these Morgans being uploaded into operators. January isn't Morgan, it just has Morgan's voice, Morgan's knowledge, and Morgan's goals from that period in time. January even says this to you. I've been thinking about the video Alex showed you. Your brother believes that version of you is the true Morgan. But why? Just because it came first? If someone had made you, then I suppose your truest self would be the one that fulfills whatever purpose your maker intended. I know who made me, and why. Did someone make you, Morgan? Were you made for something? If not, you'll have to invent your own purpose, or have none at all. Strangely, of all the things I know about you, I don't know what you believe. You have to decide, Morgan. Who are you? January does question your actions over the course of the game as well. If you choose to save people, for example, it will question why, since the plan is to blow up the station. There are endings in the game where you can escape with others, but it is still a fair question to ask of the player if they intend to blow up the station. Everyone here is going to end up dying anyway. What's the point in saving them? Is it just a natural human instinct of compassion? or something else. To sum it up, Morgan Yu works superbly as a protagonist. Morgan's backstory has the player constantly questioning their own actions, and actions they never even took part in but the other characters hold them accountable for. It gives the player a lot to think about in terms of what the other Morgans tried to achieve, and if any of them were right. And it brings up some interesting perspectives on who we are. We may be the same Morgan biologically, but behaviour, personality and thoughts wise were different. Alex Yu is also a great character and is my favourite in the game. He's someone who has done evil things but is also trying to rectify them. Over the course of the game he expresses how much he regrets a lot of the decisions he made, especially in regards to how he treated Morgan. I wish there was something I could have said to snap you out of this... fugue. It's my fault. I gambled too much. 
And the worst part? It isn't losing the station or the tech. It's you. I lost my brother. That is a mistake I will never recover from. If you read text logs or listen to audio files, then you'll understand that Alex is a very evil person. To the point where the crew aboard Talos 1 planned a mutiny against him and Morgan. Alex was perfectly fine with seeing the effects the Typhon had on subjects, even if it meant they would die. Mimics, for example, can only reproduce if they have a host, which means that a host has to die for them to reproduce. He also threatened to, and even did use Neuromods to erase memories of those who found out what was really going on, which is what he did to Morgan. As said, Morgan was originally with Alex on the experiments, but eventually realized how fucked up it was. Alex saw this as a problem, and so he had Morgan's memories erased again and again and again, in order to keep Morgan from interfering. Every time he did it though, the new Morgan became much more insistent on shutting down the experiments, which is where Morgan's plan started. Throughout the game, Alex is aware of your memory loss and tries to convince you not to blow up the station. He even proves to you that this is not what you originally wanted. However, as we've established, that Morgan isn't you. Alex never really lies to you or deceives you throughout the game. In fact, he tries to do the opposite. He only temporarily stops you from making decisions until you have more context. He doesn't even stop you from blowing up Talos 1. He says how much he disagrees with the decision and hopes you don't do it, but at the end of the day he leaves the choice to you. More interesting storylines can occur throughout the game as said before of Michaela. You first find her lying on the floor without being able to move or breathe. You can completely ignore her and let her die, but if you save her then you can learn that both her and Morgan were in a relationship for some time, and you can also find out the previously said backstory about her father, and what you choose to do with it. Also a fun fact, her father is voiced by Mr. Dikovich from Spider-Man 2 and 3. Do you have a family? Crap the Typhon Cacoplasmus. I have a daughter. They took me from her. I was promised I would see her again. I signed your papers! Dio Igwe is a cool one. He starts off in a cargo container with low oxygen. You can either save him, kill him, or leave him to die. If you save him, then he can create new materials for you, and will even ask you to do tasks such as retrieving important mementos to him. Sarah Alazar asks you to help her hold off Typhon in security, but you could also let the Typhon in and get them all killed. I'll talk more about those effects in a bit. What is cool is that Michaela, Dio, and January all hold up in your office, and different interactions can play out between them depending on who is alive or what tasks you've done. One of my favorite side quests is one with the chef. So you walk into a cafeteria with Typhon, you take them out, and then you go to meet the chef. He doesn't really recognize you, but he says that he will let you in if you go get an award of his. You bring it to him and he lets you in. The thing is that this chef is an imposter, and he will trap you if you go into the freezer. There are a couple signs that he's not the real chef though. First of all, the real chef has a different voice and face. Second off, the real chef in his audio logs shows that he knows and has met Morgan. Same with the photograph that has the chef's face scratched out. He's actually a Russian volunteer who killed the chef and took his identity. He also murdered Abigail Foy, who is the girlfriend of Danielle's show. At this point in the game, you're trying to collect voice samples of Danielle to get past a voice identification door. You can find Abigail's body in the freezer, and then you can find Danielle, who gives you the remaining voice samples. This interaction can play out a couple different ways. If you kill the chef, then meet Danielle, she will thank you for avenging Abigail. But if the chef traps you, then he will escape and lay traps all around the station and try to kill you. Danielle will then demand that you kill him. I like that the game rewards those who manage to figure out the chef, but also provides an interesting experience for those who fall prey to his manipulation. You can also just completely ignore this mission and go and collect the voice samples through the audio files and Danielle's song, semi of Geometry. Though, my favorite point in the entire game is when Dahl invades the station and is ordered by your own parents to kill everyone aboard, including you, and clean up the situation. There are a couple of different ways this can go. First of all, if you save Sarah and her crew, then he will bait you into saving them by slowly removing the oxygen from the cargo bay. If you have killed a lot of the surviving crew on board the station, then he will congratulate you and ask you to hunt down remaining targets and promises to take you back alive for doing his work. 
This turns out to be a trick, but the fact that the game even took this into account is awesome. If you've saved everyone so far, he will constantly taunt you and play tricks on you. During the attack, Lufa Glass will contact you and will ask you to try and help him. Only that he's dead and it was a trap. If you remember seeing his body earlier in the game though, you can avoid his tricks. If you save Dio, then you can knock out Dahl and remove his memories to make him an ally and have him pilot his ship back home with the surviving crew. Dahl also has a technician operator destroying Talos 1 systems, which you have to hunt down. A cool thing is that its location is random on every playthrough. If you destroy the operator first, then Dahl will go up to the Arboretum and try to kill Alex. There are so many different ways this event can play out and it's crazy how many different scenarios the game takes into account. After the sequence, the Apex Predator arrives and starts devouring the station. Now Morgan has to make the choice on whether or not to explode the station or detonate a bomb that destroys all the Typhon. You make the decision and then get a very anticlimactic cinematic. I keep having this dream. Thank god this isn't the actual ending of the game, but I'll get to that in a bit. So, Prey is a game with terrific world building and interesting lore with great characters. Keyword is lore, though. You see, all of Prey's cool narrative parts are in the world building, and if you go through the whole game experiencing every audio log, reading all the backstories of the crew and experiments, and doing all the interesting interactions, then yeah, it's a pretty interesting story that poses interesting questions on ideology and morals. But, the way the story itself plays out in the game leaves much to be desired. Here is the entire story of Prey 2017, if we ignore all of the interesting lore in the game and ignore every side quest or just anything that isn't the main narrative. You have the intro sequence where you find out everything's a lie. You go to your office to watch a video, your brother shuts it down, you reactivate it. You then go all the way to a location to get your arming key to blow up the station, but it needs voice identification. You get the necessary voice samples, get your arming key, and then eject from the station. You make it back inside all the way back up to Alex, and then Dahl arrives. You deal with Dahl, and then you get the ending. The way the main story plays out is frankly boring. If you ignore everything else in the game and just do the main story, then yeah, you'll probably think the story is boring or uninteresting. Prey's narrative is amazing when you have the complete picture, when you learn the backstory of the station and its experiments, what happened with Alex and Morgan, and you do all the interesting interactions. But if you just play the main story, then you only get a piece of the picture. You don't get any of the cool stuff. So yeah, that's probably why the narrative in this game has a mixed response. People who did everything in the game enjoyed the world and the lore and interesting questions the game poses, as well as cool interactions, People who didn't and just did the main story thought it was boring, and to be honest, I can't blame them. But the actual ending of the game doesn't come until after the credits where it is revealed that everything you have just experienced, the entire game, is a simulation. Now your immediate reaction to this ending is probably something like, what the fuck, what a shit plot twist, but it's actually pretty cool. You're in a secret location with Alex and other characters such as Dio, Sarah, Danielle, and Michaela and they judge you on things that you did throughout the game. They judge you based on whether or not you helped them, and if you did, whether or not you did extra side missions with them. They judge you on if you used Nero mods and how many you did use, and if you used any Typhon ones. They also judge you on how many Typhon you killed, as well as how many humans you killed or saved. I like this a lot because every time you play through the game and make different choices, you'll get to hear different lines of dialogue and see what the characters think of you. Eventually, Alex reveals that what you experienced in the game was a reconstruction based on Morgan's memories and that the world has been taken over by Typhon. It's not known what happened to Morgan or if Morgan is even still alive at this point. All we know is that whatever method Morgan tried to deal with the Typhon didn't work. Alex says that it was based on Morgan's memories though. It's not 100% accurate. The events that you played through in the game did in fact happen, but not exactly how you experienced. For example, you can kill Alex in the game, and yet he will still be here at the end. The goal here is to inject human abilities into Typhons. Early on in the game, Alex explains how Typhon lack mirror neurons, which allows animals to feel empathy. People are quick to project human features onto things they don't understand. 
The Typhon kill us without hesitation. But it's not because they're evil. It's because they can't do otherwise. Do you know what we discovered? They lack mirror neurons. For all their wonderful abilities, there's one thing we can do that they can't. Empathize with the suffering of another living creature. Humans tried injecting Typhon abilities into themselves, but Alex wants to see if the opposite can work. That way they can have a Typhon that can communicate with both its own kind and humans, and build a bridge to hopefully stop the invasion. So they have a Typhon experience Morgan's memories of the Talos 1 infestation, and judge to see whether or not it can empathize with humans. And that's why the game takes all of these categories into account, to see whether or not you connect with the people you meet, and understand their needs. One funny way this thing can go is if you kill literally everyone on board the station, you don't even get an ending choice. Speaking of the ending choice, you either join Alex and the crew and help them on their journey to building a bridge with the Typhon, or you murder them all. Both endings are pretty cool, if not abrupt. So the main theme of the game is empathy. It's reinforced so many times throughout the game. The only time I think it isn't done well is if you kill Aaron Ingram, who turns out to have tried to fuck a kid. January will then contact you and be like, yeah, he may have done some fucked up shit, but did he deserve to die, man? Morgan, did you hesitate? At all? I'm sure he wasn't a good man, but could you have done otherwise, given the opportunity? The Typhon can only kill and destroy, but you're human. You have a choice. <sighs> Why try and make things so black and white when I could just be left to reflect on my own decisions? Luckily, this is the only time the game does this. It never makes it black and white on whether your decisions are good or bad again. I like that the point of the game is to test a player on whether or not they have remorse over their actions, or can just relate to the struggles of others. It brings back to the question of why save people on the station if they're going to blow it up. I think it's because of empathy. It may even be why you choose not to blow up the station. You don't want to kill anyone. Or even why you escape after blowing it up. Yes, saving these people may pose a giant risk for Earth since they, or even you, may have Typhon selves in you, but at the same time, do you want to be responsible for all their deaths? The point of the game is that we have the ability to empathize with one another and it's something we take for granted. The Typhon is a reflection of what humans could be if some of our most basic brain functions were gone. Just a mindless organism killing for survival without a second thought. However, Alex and the other crew members did manipulate you. They made you experience events you thought were real to see if their experiment worked. You were their guinea pig and forced to undergo an experiment you didn't volunteer for. Then again, I don't know how a Typhon would volunteer. The only reason Alex is doing this is because it's a last ditched effort to stop the Typhon, and so it's your choice to either help those who gave you the ability to empathize, or kill them for enslaving you into this program. Prey's story is great when everything comes together. The characters all have unique and interesting interactions, there are hundreds of unique scenarios that can play out depending on your choices, the game judges you for your actions and poses interesting questions about empathy and humanity. It's just a shame that the main story itself is uninteresting. And if you just play the game doing the main objectives, you probably won't enjoy the story. But if you go out of your way to explore all of the backstory behind all the characters in Talos 1 and interact with all the characters, then yeah, the game provides a pretty damn good story. So in 2018, an expansion for Prey released named Moon Crash. You play as multiple different characters, doing different story objectives, and escaping the moon in different ways. There is also some new weapons, all of which are really fun to use. The map is pretty small, but what makes it interesting to explore is that each time you play the expansion, the map is randomized. Some areas might be lacking power, some areas might be covered in radiation or fire, or some of the stairs might be broken. Plus, if you die, that character stays dead until you restart the whole simulation. Also, that character can become a phantom when you play as another character. Moon Crash, despite being smaller than the main game, still has a lot of replayability. You don't unlock the story objectives right away. First, you have to do specific objectives to unlock the story. The story objectives aren't particularly interesting. Rarely used just requires you to put in some control modules and then test a null wave. VJs just requires you to go to a location and make a choice to fall poisoned. Jones just requires you to find someone who turned into a Typhon and kill them. 
and then place a statue they made. Claire requires you to get rid of evidence, and Adrius has you try to find the toy of your child before finding out that it was a trick and dying. The objectives themselves aren't that interesting, but what is interesting is how you get from each one. Like, yeah, your objective might just be go here and activate this, but when you consider the pseudo-permadeath mechanic, as well as any enemies you need to encounter along the way, as well as the fact that the survival mode options from the campaign are automatically turned on here, meaning that weapons degrade over time and damage taken from specific things will have bad effects on your character, it makes getting from one location to another really interesting. The combat is just as fun here as the main game, and it can also choose different loadouts with points you've earned on different playthroughs. It's also a pretty lengthy expansion, it took me over 17 hours to finish it. The story in the expansion is that you play as a guy named Peter, and you're in a satellite next to a moon base, and they have lost connection to the moon base, so you have to relive the events that happened using an operator that was recovered. As you later find out, the operator is actually the consciousness of Riley Yu, the cousin of Alex and Morgan Yu. Riley uploaded her consciousness into the operator because she didn't know if she was going to make it off the moon alive and this was a way to ensure she survived in some way. This is where things get weird though. So it makes sense that the Looking Glass would be able to simulate Riley's experiences on the moon, but how does it simulate other characters' experiences? Anyway, the characters all have their own stories to tell, and it's really cool. Some of them even tie in with other characters. Claire's storyline ties in with Riley's death as she activated a command in the operator to kill Riley as soon as her consciousness was put into it, VJ's ties in with Claire's as well, as she kills his man and he has to track her down. You get the choice to kill her or spare her. She says that you shouldn't blow her escape pod up because other people are inside with her, which seems very suspicious, but when you scan the pod it does say that there are life signs in the pod, however it could just be her life signs. It's up to you whether you kill her or let her live. I wish Andreas's and Joan's stories tied in with the other characters as well, because they're just their own standalone stories and I think it would have been more interesting if everyone's stories tied in with each other in some way. Another feature is that you can't install every type of Neuromod for every character. Every character can only install specific ones. So if you have a character that can't get a hacking ability, then you can't hack doors as that character. Or if you play as a character that can't install Electrostatic Burst, then you can't use that ability as that character. So the way you explore the moon and take part in combat will be different for each character. There are also a lot of creative ways to get around problems. The moon has these Typhon gates that close if they detect Typhon. There are a couple ways around this, however. You can destroy all the Typhon in the area. You can take the power out of the area, though that affects the area itself. Or you can temporarily disable it with an EMP or disruptor. The moon shark behaves like the antlions in the sand traps chapter of Half-Life 2. He listens to vibrations on the floor, and to avoid him you have to stay on rocks. Cool idea, but it's way too easy to avoid him. To complete the expansion, you need to complete all Kazma orders. Kazma is a rival company to Trendstar, only more vicious. Basilic is a character that contacts you throughout the expansion, and she also works for Kazma. Though Kazma also views her as expendable, same with Peter. She does seem to care for Peter and empathize with him, as they're both stuck in the same situation. She even sends Peter pictures of his family to make him happy. The head of Kazma, Teddy, then contacts you and thanks you for your work and then tries to kill you. Peter manages to escape to the moon and boards a shuttle to Earth, but Basilek's fate is left ambiguous. The after credits then shows him escaping the shuttle, but a mimic mimicked the doll of his daughter, and now it's coming back to Earth with him. It's not really a satisfying ending, but I think that's the point. The expansion is meant to make you feel as if you accomplished nothing and that you're just a tool for Kazma. The story isn't as interesting as the main game, but I still enjoyed it for what it was. So yeah, it's a really fun expansion. It has new weapons and features that make combat more unique, and every playthrough will provide a different experience, and the expansion not only has a good length, but is also highly replayable. Mooncrash is a really solid expansion. So over a year after Prey's release, new content was being added. Obviously Mooncrash was the main one, but other modes got added as well. First one being Typhon Hunter. Typhon Hunter is a multiplayer mode where one person plays as Morgan, and five others play as Mimics. Morgan has to hunt down the Mimics disguised as other objects. Yeah, it's, it's Prop Hunt. That's it. If you've played Prop Hunt in Gary's Mortal Call of Duty, then yeah, you've played Typhon Hunter. Oh look, it's fucking Femboy Morgan. To be fair, this is a mode that fits really well within the concept of Prey. Mimics are basically Prop Hunt players in the game itself, so it makes sense to have this as a multiplayer mode. 
However, there are a couple things wrong with this mode, and I don't really think it's worth playing. First of all, Morgan is way too powerful in this mode and will win pretty much every single match. Mimics can only stay mimicked for a set amount of time before then having to move or mimic another object. The issue is that the sidebar is also tied to sprinting, so if you've been mimicked for a good amount of time and then Morgan notices you, then running away isn't really an option. The only defense mimics have against Morgan is a surprise attack when Morgan is dead for 10 seconds in a 5 minute match. So killing Morgan doesn't even do much. Plus, look how long it takes before you can actually do the attack. There is also the Psychoscope that spawns two minutes into the match, which shows the location of all the Mimics. To be fair, the Mimics do get warned when this happens, but when it does, they're pretty much just dead. It's just the match is over at that point. Even if you do run away, Morgan is faster. Basically, Morgan has every advantage over the Mimics. Morgan is faster, the Mimics run out of sight really easily, and even if you do somehow manage to have issues finding the Mimics, the game gives you a cheat code to find them two minutes in. I've played matches that lasted less than a minute because of how easy it is to find Mimics. Look at the leaderboards. The top Morgan player has won 788 matches. The top Mimic player has won 82. That's a ratio of 39 to 394, meaning that if you play as a Mimic in this mode, you have a 12% chance of winning. Second off is the maps. There are only three maps, Morgan's Office, Morgan's Apartment, and the Yellow Turnip Club. So playing this game gets very repetitive. If you play the game for 15 minutes, you'll see all the content it has to offer. Plus, all the maps are very small, which only makes it easier for Morgan to find the Mimics. Next issue is the engine. Prey and Mooncrash run on the Cry Engine, which most people will know for games such as Crisis. Now, Prey doesn't look as good as those games graphically, but at least it runs well. However, Typhon Hunter uses Unreal Engine. So first off, the game looks worse, but it also plays worse. Morgan has no weight when moving around. It just feels like you're sliding. There's no head bobbing or weapon bobbing when moving, and when sprinting, the FOV just zooms out a bit. The wrench has a smaller hitbox when hitting things, and none of the hits feel satisfying. I was excited to try this mode out because Prey is one of my all-time favorite video games, and I have many friends who love the game as well, so the idea of being able to play the game together was really cool, but sadly, it's a multiplayer that was slapped together in probably a few months or weeks. It's mostly just ported assets from the main game. It feels like a beta, this doesn't feel like a finished product. The concept is great if unoriginal. All you need to do is add more maps, have more variety of maps, big, medium, small, which you could easily do considering the variety of locations in Prey, make Morgan slower than the Mimics, that way Mimics still have a chance to get away, but Morgan still has a gun with limited ammo for long range, and only give the Psychoscope in the last 30 seconds of the match, and also make Morgan control the same as the main game. Your angel of death awaits, Baggy. Your angel of death awaits. <laughs> You're a fuck nugget. <laughs> You're a fuck nugget. <laughs> hey, buddy. I like your hat. Uh, let's just uh, let's just watch. Yeah, I'm gonna check my emails. Boop, boop, boop. Oh, the screen's black. Fucking Windows 10 update again. One. Indiana Jones. Dun, 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 dun. Mm -hmm. Jump forwards and then hold backwards. Yeah, you see that? The animation spazzes out. <laughs> you know? Oh no! Ah, ah, mercy! Oh wait, what if I jump up here? Ah, try and get me up here. Oh shit! <laughs> God damn it. Also, I think more multiplayer modes could be added to Prey. Even if it's something simple like a horde mode where you and three other friends have to hold out against the Typhon. That could be fun. You could also have a multiplayer mode similar to Dead Space 2 where one team plays as Transtar crew trying to complete objectives and another team plays as Typhon trying to kill the players. Or maybe have a small co-op mode where you and a friend have to find a way to escape Talos 1. Basically Mooncrash but co-op. Mooncrash would work really well as a co-op mode. 
There's actually a good number of multiplayer modes you could add for Prey, and you could even reuse assets in a lot of instances. I'd love a multiplayer portion for Prey, especially if it's really good. But as it stands, there's only one mode, and it sucks dick. There is an extra mode for Typhon Hunter though, called Transtar VR. It's a VR mode where you play in Morgan's apartment, Morgan's office, or the Yellow Turnip Club, and you complete tasks such as testing a Norwave device, or unlocking a door using Danielle's voice, or getting the Looking Glass technology online. There's also a museum that you can explore that has some awesome stuff to look at. I haven't played Transtar VR because I don't have a VR headset. If I did, I would have done a video on Half-Life Alex already. But I can already say it looks much more interesting than the multiplayer. Otherwise though, I've heard there's not much else to it. Even people who've played it have said the tasks are kind of mundane and don't have much to them apart from it being VR. Playing Prey in this kind of perspective must be kind of fun. But once again, it's only three maps, and the objectives in them are just kind of meh. It's definitely better than the multiplayer mode, but it still lacks content and is still pretty mediocre. And even for a VR experience in 2018, you can do much better. So in terms of post-launch content, Mooncrash is the only worthwhile one to experience. In terms of soundtrack, Prey is one of my all-time favorites. It was composed by Mick Gordon, who is mostly known for his Doom soundtracks. But Prey is probably my favorite work of his. Each track has a memorable melody, and it creates a unique atmosphere. The title screen music has this new adventure with mystery feeling that sets up the game you're about to experience. Typhon Voices is another favourite of mine. It gives an unnerving tone whenever you're exploring a new area with Typhon in them. The Phantoms is the combat track in the game, and it works really good. It has a paranoid and uncontrollable feel to it, which makes combat more terrifying. Into the Tunnels is great because it feels like you're opening up much more of the station, and it gives you the feeling that there is even more to explore. I also like a lot of the tracks that play when you explore parts of the station. They give a lonely feeling, usually only containing a few instruments, but they also give a grandiose feeling of exploring a beautiful area.
Alex's theme perfectly captures the regretful nature of the character, and I like that the melody plays whenever you die. December and January's theme gives the feeling that you're getting closer and closer to achieving your objective. Semi-Secret Geometry is Danielle's song, and it plays during one of my favorite sequences in the game, where you hold off against Typhon in the Yellow Turnip Club, and the pace of the song fits so well with combat. I love Mind Game because it's both the first and last song you hear in the game. The lyrics fit as Prey in of itself is a mind game and the song gives a feeling of finality. I love Realization from Mooncrash. It's the opposite of Mind Game, where the song makes you wonder if you even achieved anything at all, and it gives you a feeling that there's much worse to come. What's also cool about the last three tracks I mentioned is that they weren't composed by Mick Gordon, and they were composed by Raphael Colantino, the writer and director of the game. Raphael is a musician and has his own YouTube channel where he makes music, and he's even in a band called Weird Wolves. Mick Gordon himself has said that this made composing music for the game much easier, since Raphael knows how music works and could perfectly describe what he needs. Speaking of Raphael, there might be something coming up with him in a moment. Anyway, Prey's soundtrack is fantastic. There isn't much music in the game, but that makes it more memorable when it does play, and it captures every appropriate mood that the game needs. So, when deciding on what else to do with this Prey 2017 video, I decided to contact the creative director of the game, Raphael Colantino, 
and have an interview with him and talk about the game and ask some questions. This is the first time I've done something like this, and it surprisingly went pretty well. I'll let the rest of the interview speak for itself. Hi, I'm Rafael Colantonio, founder of Arkane Studios, former president and co-creative director at Arkane Studios. I was the creative director of Prey. When I, I was at Arcane, we we were really focusing on one type of game that was always the same. They, they, they all had the same kind of like, it was the same genre, the same family. We, we call those immersive sims. And, um, you know, we, from our first one, it was Arx Fatalis to then Dark Messiah and Dishonored. And so Prey was really one more of those in a different setting. And back then, uh, we... We wanted to do one of those. We uh, we had an idea for 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 a setting that was not necessarily space, but uh, uh, Bethesda wanted us to do to do Prey, to do a reboot of Prey, and that was the way it happened. Which you know we we said okay, as long as we are able to reboot it to the point where it, where it becomes our Prey, not not a sequel to the original, but uh, uh, something that on one hand accommodated. Uh, their desire to see that franchise keeping on going, and on, on our end, um, being able to make to make it, but the way we would do it with, with the with the values uh, we had at Arcane. Right. Because a lot of people were questioned about that when the game was first announced uh, with the 2006 Prey. Um, you know, a lot of people at first were wondering, like, if it was related to the game in any way whatsoever. Yeah, no, it was, yeah, it was not. It was, yeah, it was, uh... It worked out, you know, since, like, they were, they, was, they were common, like, it was first person, uh, uh, in space, against aliens, so there were, there was some theme that made sense, but that was pretty much the extent of the, the of it, for the similarities. The rest was really its own game. It was, uh, I mean, the fact that we call it Mimic because there were, there's a monster in Dungeons and Dragons that is uh, a treasure chest that when, that would fool the, the adventurers into, I don't know if you've ever played Dungeons and Dragons, but it's an, it was this old monster from the 80s where it would look like a treasure chest and as you open it, it's got teeth and, you know, it bites you basically, so. Uh, it was a trap, and uh, we thought wouldn't it be great if we had something like this? Because the treasure chest, of course, doesn't really apply to space, but if it could turn into anything, uh, and uh, and then we thought, but if you if you much later on into the development of the game, we also decided that the way to grow our character was to acquire powers from the. Uh, from the aliens and therefore it meant oh but then it means that you could be able to turn into anything which of course freaked out the programmers but it was very fun for the designers <laughs> yeah that's one of my favorite abilities in the game uh i'm sure they were all hard in their own ways but uh i think there was uh, a particular challenging I mean, the arboretum was pretty crazy because it's so huge and it was uh, complex for the arboretum being the place where, you know, you see the space and it's, it's on the top of the, the top of the space station. It's a kind of a hub to a lot of different areas. And that was pretty painful for performance reasons. But I think from an engineering standpoint, uh, the beginning of the game was probably uh, the most complex. We had to really engineer those rotation uh, rotating panels and uh, crazy mechanic that would that would hold the illusions together until you break through your apartment balcony and realize that it's all kind of like a setup and but it still has to make sense and how did they do that to you how were you observed and and then the player has to retrace all they did during the very beginning of the game and, and make sense of it and, and re realize that they did not see as they were going through it, the, the trap, you know, the, the setup. And uh, 
uh, that was that was that was interesting because I remember the level designers at the time. Uh, Albert, his name was, and I remember him uh, and anyone the testers as well who had played the game a million times. They would see all the tricks and they would they would say the, the players are going to figure it out. They're going to figure it out. Like it's it's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> like because from the test rooms you could see your apartment actually. Yeah. But because we had fooled the mind of the player with, with such magnitude we're you know taking a, a a helicopter ride and like there's no way the player is gonna recognize his apartment there's no way they're even gonna map it to a possibility that their apartment would be there right and uh but you know i think when you're when you're too much in it you you see all the all those things and you stop stop panicking uh, but yeah that was probably the hardest level like we spent a lot of testing to really get that beginning really perfect Mm. Yeah, and it's one of the moments that's left the most impression on people. So I'd, I'd say it definitely paid off. I hope so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and if I were to remember any of those, it would be complicated. Because this is true for any of our games, and I'm pretty sure any of the games that are being developed in general. Uh, it's so iterative and uh, yeah there were areas that were never made or, or dropped or you know powers that were changed or dropped new weapons we had in mind that were not made etc etc uh different classes of aliens different powers that they were supposed to have um yeah actually uh i actually did on reddit i i, I released one one of the videos that um of a of a, of a Mimic power that was never um, never shown in the game because we never never did it. We never went to the uh, to develop it ultimately. Uh, but we had this video of uh, a mimic turning into humans and vice versa, uh, and that was pretty cool. But it's just, I mean, at some point you got to close the box and make it fit. And uh, yeah, so yeah, there's always there's always stuff that gets cut. The most funny thing, I mean, it became a thing in the game, it became like a kind of a meme almost, is uh, our lead programmer at the time, Stephen Hurd, uh, started to put a few post, post-it notes saying not a mimic, uh, when they were like, for example, you know, he would, there would be like two game pads on his office, and he would, one of them would have not a mimic on it, like with the, with the the post-it notes, the yellow post-it notes. Yeah, and, and we thought it was so funny that uh, we have to put that in the in the game. So it's not like it was in the game, and then people started to put it in in the, in the real life. It's like it was in real life, and then we put it in the game. Uh, and people really, really loved that, and uh, they started to you know take pictures or started to joke about that. But sometimes you know, and then it and then that's it, and then it becomes a thing. It's thrown into the world and, and, and it becomes, you know, it's there for years. It's really weird how life is and how uh, create the creation, the creativity, uh, the creation process, sorry, the creative process uh, happens. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's arbitrary. Someone does something and you don't really think so much of it and you put it in the game and and then it really impacts people for, for many, many years, you know. Yeah. Um, I always found that funny in the game. Like, this is the one room where everything is labeled not a mimic. Yeah. There's another story which is funny, is the Reployer. Uh, the Reployer was... <laughs> it, was, it, was it was supposed to be a, a, some sort of a computer or something. and But it was, it was designed in a way that, to me, did not really fit the visual. Like, I could not understand what it was every time. And it was just meant to be this random appliance. And every time there was a there was a uh, a visual review, I would I would point at it. I would I would ask the art director, "What is this? What is this thing?" And they would never be able to tell me because the the, the artist who does it was not there in the room. And so it happens like this for like weeks. And every time I was like, "Guys, someone deletes this thing. I never want to see it anymore." 
<laughs> and uh, and so they deleted it. And uh, and then I thought again. I said, no, no, no. Actually, put it back in. We're gonna find a crazy name, something that doesn't mean anything that people are gonna think. Like maybe it's some sort of uh, military device or whatever. We call it Reployer. And we're going to make it a thing. We're going to make it that people actually have an email of threads in the station where they're wondering what it is. Uh, and there are going to be theories about it. But we'll never, exp we'll never explain it to the players. We'll never explain it to anyone. Nobody knows what this, is, this, this thing is. The same way I didn't. I never knew, right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, it, becomes, it became the, the, the internal joke, the, the re reployer. And, um, and eventually we... Even we came up with a few theories of what this thing could be. And one of them was that it would be the self-destroying uh, system of the, of the space station. Yeah, so it would be the, the self-destroying system of the, of the station where uh, those are actually bombs that, that are entire, you know, uh, spread into the station. Another theory was that this was actually a spying device. From the uh, from the investors, uh, and uh, so that was that was another that was another way to look at it. And uh, we we never really ag not agreed, but we never really settled it. We never did, you know we did, never decided what it truly is. So it's still up in the air. No, I mean, other than, other than the fact that it's part of that family of immersive sims, which is, comes with its own set of values, you know, cohesive world, um, the world is bigger than the player, um, there are choices and consequences to everything, verticality is important, etc. I mean, all these things that we also had for Dishonored and, uh, and frankly, even back in the days with Arch Fatalis in, in uh, 2000 or something. Um, yeah, we were obsessed with this kind of game. So System Shock was also one of them. And uh, those are really, yeah, it's really the inspiration, I would say. It's Looking Glass, you know, Looking Glass at uh, Duck Church. Uh, it was very instrumental to our own uh, design, our own passion for games. Hmm. Um, are you interested in the System Shock remake that's uh, being made right now? Uh, yes, of course. Yes, I'm interested. I, I don't necessarily obsess over it like I would have when I was uh, 30, but um, simply because, uh, you know, the uh, an IP is not really a guarantee of anything. So I, I'd, be, I'd be more obsessed if it's the people who did it that do a new game, whether it's System Shock or not, right? Uh, the fact that there is a remake of System Shock, you know, I, I, I don't know the people. I, I hope it's, um, um, I, I hope they, they, they share the passion, the passion for the original and that they, they are going to adapt it to, you know, the modern world of gamers, which is, is a challenge. It's, it's, it's hard because the world has evolved and gamers are different, etc. So I'm excited without, without obsessing over it. All right. And I wish them good luck. I wish them the best of luck, obviously. Uh, probably uh, it's too hardcore, a little too uh, obscure in many ways. I mean, I think it's the benefits of the flaws as well. Like the, the fact that it's so obscure means that there's a lot of secrets and a lot of things for players to to find about. But it was a hard game to sell in a way that um, it it has so much to offer and it's not it's not, it's not focused enough probably. So I think. Uh, some people, I mean, now it's very popular, people talking about it, some of it probably because of Game Pass or whatever, but uh, it's those games are hard to sell. And uh, there was poor player onboarding. I think the tuning was not far from great. We stretched it too much. So towards the end, if you really look at how many hours of game we, we, we offered with this game, there's too many. Uh, it, it could be a little more focused, a little more of a, of a clean space. Uh, well-balanced experience as opposed to something stretched out where at the end you got to go back and like do all those things and and now the, the the station is infested with even more nightmares and even more corals and all that and it was yeah it was a little stretchy i think it's mostly a problem of tuning and onboarding the player because other than that i'm pretty proud of the game in general i think it uh you know i wish the ai was more solid 
Um, but yeah, overall, you know, we, we um, I'm pretty proud of the game. Yeah, I'm very happy with the game that got released. Yes, uh, I I did. I did see some stuff, um, but I haven't seen in a long time because I left. Uh, and while I was still very friends with them, uh, at some point, I you know I I did not have access to all the latest uh, latest builds or whatever. Uh, I did visit them a few years ago, and I saw it and. It looked promising, but I'm talking about two years ago, probably. So I haven't seen it in two years. Hmm. Uh, are you interested in seeing the final product? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, those are those are very good friends, and I'm um, very excited about uh, them carrying on and you know having our chain evolve its own way now, which uh, which which is, I guess, I guess it's like having a kid and. At some point, you you can you know you can't control them. <laughs> You're just going to do their thing, and that, that's great. I think it's part of life. Yeah. So uh, I'm um, I play with a with a woman that her name is Eva Gore, and uh, we uh, we have uh, it's probably something called like electro rock goth kind of kind of band, mm-hmm. and uh, so it's very. Like 80s, 90s, kind of inspired but modernized with the different, you know, now there's now there's sounds and vibe, hopefully. Uh, and uh, our very latest song is called uh, our very latest song is called Overdrive, and it's it's actually uh, part of Weird West, uh, the, the game I'm working on with uh, Wolf Eye. Uh, and uh, it's it's w- working pretty well for us. It's uh, you know, people really like that song and. Uh, and I think the fact that it's going to be in the game is going to it's going to help as well. I, I've I've put some of my music in games since uh, Dishonored 2 actually, with uh, the credit for uh, for Dishonored 2 was uh, was mine, produced by our audio director at the time, Matt Pierso, who is also our audio director now on, on Weird West uh, with Wolf Eye. And uh, Prey as well, in fact, I did, I did uh, Mind Game, the, the, the opening song and the credit song, uh, also produced by Matt Pearsall. And then uh, in the Moon Crash, uh, the DLC, I, I also did the credits song after I was gone, but uh, Arcane offered me to do the credit song for, um, for Moon Crash. So it's called Realization. Uh, and that's when the band got started with, uh, with Eva. Um, lots of fun. Um, I love it. It's it's a little bit of my, you know, making games is a very collaborative effort and spread amongst a lot of people. And at the end, you don't you're not even quite sure what what you are, who, what's idea, what ideas are yours and what ideas are not yours, um, because everybody modifies each other's ideas. And then there's, there's so much uh, layers between you and the final product, you know. Um, but in, in music, it's not like this. It's just the two of us, and, and we have uh, we have a lot of impact. I mean, we have full impact on the on what's happening. And because there's no there's nothing at stake other than our own passion and and arts and creativity, we don't care. We if it doesn't you know if it doesn't sell in a way. I mean, we we'd rather it sell. It's it's kind of satisfying because it's validating that people like what you do, but Unlike in games, if a game doesn't sell, it's a catastrophe uh, because it's like the full organization that collapses. In music, you pretty much do something as as true as possible to your creative self, and yeah, you know, it's that's what's good as well. Yeah, I've listened to a lot of it. It's really good. Oh, thank you so much. Well, Weird West, it's a pretty, it's a pretty heavy game already. Uh, you know, we, um, it's a, it's also an immersive sim, so very similar to um, my past work. Um, and I have uh, in the team is also there's also a lot of people that uh, come from where we come, you know, from our team. And so. We got we about like it should ship this year. It's gonna ship this year. 
it will shoot this year. Uh, and uh, it's an immersive sim. It's uh, this time the main difference is that it's open world kind of thing, but not open world in the sense of Fallout 4, but more open world in the sense of Fallout 2, which is there's a travel map and you travel to, to locations. So there's a huge travel map and there's many locations and you travel and between the, as you travel, something might happen in the middle, etc. cetera. Uh, and it's set in the, in, in the West, you know, uh, a fantasy version of the West, and uh, it's kind of like an action RPG. I mean, frankly, it's really uh, an immersive sim. That's why it's like at the intersection between uh, action, adventuring, RPG, and simulation. Uh, there's a lot of uh, you know, so everything is action driven. Uh, all your all your um, decisions are action driven. Everything, but. But your growth has some form of like different paths, and there can be consequences to what you do, etc. So, it, it, yeah, the best way to, to present it is an immersive sim. It's a really big game. It's probably the biggest game we've made. Frankly, it's uh, it's a very hard game to make, even though we have a much much smaller team than I've had in the past when I was with Arcane. Uh, but it's exciting too. I think it's. Um, it's a way for us to make a game that is just as rich, just as big, uh, but costs less. Therefore, we can be a little crazier in some ways, make, take more risks, because the market to cover our money back is actually not as big as a AAA market. Um, so, hopefully you've seen it, and we, we're going to show some more stuff pretty soon, and uh, it's very pretty, you know. Um, it's great art direction, but we are not shooting for high-end graphics. We're, we're, we're going for something that is uh, really focused on the art direction. And, and I think what what remains over time is, is the art direction. It's not so much the graphics. So it's more of a stylized look over photorealistic graphics. That's right. Yeah. All right. That's good. Um, I'm looking forward to that game. Uh, I haven't seen much about it, but I heard you were working on it. I was instantly interested. So thank you. Yeah, there's yeah. There's, uh, there's a few people from uh, former from, from uh, that are ex-arcane that were very uh, very key. So uh, yeah, you you you'll find a lot of similarities if if you've liked any of the games from that we worked on in the past. It, it's going to be very similar. Yeah, I'm looking forward to playing that. Yeah. Thank you very much for taking time of your day to talk yeah. to me. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me know when it when the when the video is out. And... I'll let you know when it's out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. In conclusion, Prey is a wonderful game. Personally, I consider it a masterpiece in terms of game design. The story has issues with the way it's told. However, the plot itself and the backstory and the world building all hold it together to provide an interesting world and story. It's just unfortunate that you'll miss out on all of that if you only do the main missions. It also has a really awesome expansion which adds more hours of cool content on, and the soundtrack is one of my all-time favourites. And it's a game with endless replayability. Prey is a game I've been constantly replaying since 2017, and I don't think I'll ever stop replaying it. It took a couple playthroughs for me to love it as much as I do now. On my first playthrough, I liked the game a lot, but I didn't love it. My second playthrough made me enjoy it even more, but it wasn't until my third or fourth playthrough when I said yes, this is one of my favorite games of all time. And while the game wasn't a massive success at release, it has gained a cult following, and more and more people are playing the game. If the game had the popularity it did now at launch, it would have been much more successful. The difference is nowadays people know what type of game this is. It's an immersive sim in the style of System Shock 2. Before release, nobody really had a true idea of what it was, and I put that down to marketing. All the marketing showed was aliens in space with guns. And then there is the name. While I like the name, it should have been called something different. As I said, Neuroshock is a far better description of what this game is. From reading that title alone, you instantly know what type of game it is and what it takes inspiration from. There's also the fact that the 2006 Prey ended on a cliffhanger that will now never get resolved, and a sequel was planned that looked really awesome but got cancelled. I like the 2006 game as well, I love the 2017 game more, but I would be lying if I said I wasn't interested with where that game was going. 
To be clear, I'm very happy with Prey 2017, I'm very happy with the game we got, I love the game. I'm just very annoyed with some of the circumstances surrounding it. In the end though, Prey is an excellent game and provides one of the most unique gaming experiences you'll ever have. And for that alone, it's worth playing.